Today on Categorical Imperatives, we are going to be talking about the truth about the Citizens United ruling in an episode that I intend to be something of an open letter to all the haters who think that Citizens United was wrongly decided. Hey, greetings. Welcome back once again to Categorical Imperatives. As always, I am your host, Locking Liberal, and I do want to thank you all so much for joining me here today. Now, if you are new to the program, I would especially like to welcome you. This is a podcast where we're going to be applying legal theory and moral philosophy to discussions of current events in law, politics, and culture. Now, today we're going to be talking about what everybody tends to get wrong about Citizens United. First, I have a couple quick announcements for you guys. First of all, don't forget, you can find the show in a number of different formats. The video version is available over on YouTube and Odyssey. The audio-only version is available on all of your favorite podcasting platforms, including Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can also find a wealth of articles that I write for a number of different organizations on a number of different topics of law and politics available at different sites such as the Libertarian Institute, the Tenth Amendment Center, the Mises Institute, and occasionally I do self-publish some work over on Substack as well. You can also check out a new website I have up that is still under construction, but what is up works just perfectly well. And so, for example, the links page is up and working. So you can go there and you can find all the places I just named where my work can be found all over the internet. There will be a link to that page down in the video description. And you can also find links over there to places where you can go and support the show, such as becoming a patron over on Patreon if you so choose. And if you would, I would certainly be grateful. Now, in my last video, uh, some of you who, well, I guess anyone who would have seen it, uh, it probably remembers we talked about Citizens United there too. And for those who didn't watch it, essentially the last video was uh, I, I briefed three landmark Supreme Court cases that looked at the relationship between money and speech. Now these cases were Buckley v. Vallejo, McConnell v. FEC, and Citizens United v. FEC. Now that last video was made as part of my Today in Supreme Court History series which is a very particular kind of video, which means what you were getting in that case was a purely objective, purely scholarly explanation of the cases, their background, the facts of the case, the primary holding and the precedent that they set, all presented in a way to make it easily understandable to lawyers and non-lawyers alike. So today's video is going to be a little different. Uh, it's going to be, as I said before, an open letter of sorts to people who think that Citizens United is a case that was wrongly decided, and especially if they think it was wrongly decided because it ruled corporations are people and money is speech. So this is going to be more of an opinion piece, I guess you could say, even though I'm objectively right, but I guess it's something you're free to disagree with me about, even though if you do, you're objectively wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, anyways. Now, time and time again, what we see is that the media will sensationalize and even occasionally rapidly vilify the Supreme Court's rulings in Citizens United, and amidst this sensationalism, we will often have the fourth estate telling you that this case turned corporations into people. Moreover, they will flash startling headlines uh, such as this one from a 2014 Huffington Post article reading, Corporations are people and they have more rights than you. Now, that article uh, made all manner of ridiculous claims about how 2010 was the year and Citizens United was the case when, for the very first time ever, for no reason whatsoever, the court out of nowhere decided the corporations were people and that is because that decision that has allowed businesses ever since then, uh, such as Hobby Lobby, for example, to trample all over women's rights with their corporate rights by refusing to pay for birth control. 
Now, I only have one uh, minor disagreement with that, uh, what they have to say about the case, and that is that none of it is true. Other than that, it's a perfectly sound argument, except that none of it is true. Now, first of all, no one is saying that corporations are flesh and blood people. Corporate personhood is a legal doctrine that has existed for hundreds of years in the English common law and can even be found going back further than that with antecedents going back to civil law in the Roman Republic. And that corporations have some legal protections and some rights was not even a fact up for debate in this case. As we talked about last time and as we will be getting to again later here today, the four dissenting liberal justices in the Citizens United ruling all accepted prima facie the doctrine of corporate personhood. And on what I guess I would consider more of just an interesting side note here uh, is that what no one ever seems to know about Hobby Lobby is that they didn't in fact contend paying for their employees' birth control. They contended paying for one very particular kind of birth control. Now, they didn't want to pay for Plan B. This is the so-called morning after pill. Now, their logic was that they are Christians, that they believe life begins at conception, and therefore, to them, that makes Plan B akin to an abortion. Now, I don't share their religion or their view about Plan B myself, but it also doesn't seem like a terribly unreasonable view to me. And really, the key thing here is, is that they never objected to covering forms of birth control like the pill that prevent pregnancy in the first place, and which makes up like 95% of all birth control. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, I digress. Let's just get back to Citizens United, I guess. So, you may be saying to yourself, well, that, that Huffington Post article that you put up is from 2014. That was eight years ago. Surely, by now, the people who were complaining about Citizens United back then, who knew nothing about the case because they had never bothered to take the hour it would take to read the court's opinion in the case at some point during the four-year time span between when the case was decided in 2010 and when that article was written in 2014. Now those people have had an additional eight years to find an hour of time to read the court's opinion in the case that they hate and don't understand, and that now their resistance must be an informed one. Except that on the anniversary of the opinion being handed down every single year, like clockwork, we find a plethora of articles, uh, such as an especially ridiculous one that I found just as an example here, uh, from a so-called journalist named Lisa Graves, and she wrote an article just uh, on January 20th, 2022. Twelve years after Citizens United, the Supreme Court right-wing revolution continues. Now that article goes on to make absurd claims about how every time any progressive leftist legislation doesn't get passed into law, it's always because dark money is flowing from corporations into the hands of members of Congress Thanks to Citizens United, which is buying these congressmen's support. She blames Citizens United for somehow being the reason that Democrats can't pass their current unconstitutional so-called voting rights legislation. And echoes a common theme that you hear from people uh, who, that you have been hearing from people who disagree with Citizens United, who don't understand Citizens United, who have been saying this from the very beginning. That Citizens United is a threat to democracy itself. Now, let's say we look past the absurdity that what these people are saying is we need congressional oversight of Congress so members of Congress can prevent themselves from being bribed. 
let's pretend that that makes sense and move on from there. Now, if you want to understand the way money in politics actually is a problem, and it is a problem, I'm not denying that at all, and you would like to know what could possibly be done to prevent it even, uh, I will uh, direct you to this, no, not that one. That article, it is an interview with Thomas Massey. He is a congressman from Kentucky, uh, and I have that linked down in the video description. And uh, he did an interview with Reason Magazine, providing the inside track on the way, the actual way, that money is corrupting the political process. It's a really good interview, really interesting information. I learned a lot from it. I encourage everyone to go check it out. And the way people speak about Citizens United as some kind of threat to democracy itself, to me, has always really perfectly encapsulated how correct H.L. Mencken was when he said, democracy is the theory that the common men know what they want and that they deserve to get it good and hard. And, in fact, both of those two different articles that I quoted from, the Huffington Post and the other more recent one, uh, both make a claim, another claim that is very commonly made uh, among people who criticize Citizens United. I find this one especially reprehensible, personally. Uh, and that is that Citizens United is a very close runner-up in second place for the most harmful and destructive Supreme Court case of all time, coming in only slightly less awful than Dred Scott. So, apparently, just off the top of my head, U.S. v. Crookshank, Plessy v. Ferguson, Buck v. Bell, Korematsu v. United States, and Cooper v. Aaron are all somehow less harmful than Citizens United, a case that simply said, that people don't lose their rights when they form into a group. And make no mistake, that is precisely what it establishes, and it will be perfectly clear by the end of this video that that is the case. Now, unsurprisingly, politicians are no better. As recently as 2016, in the presidential elections, we saw candidates who pledged to introduce constitutional amendments to overturn the Citizens United decision now, the most deliciously ironic one, I love this, um, comes from Hillary Clinton. And pay attention to this because in just, in just a minute, this is going to become so just deliciously, delightfully ironic. You're going to love it. So, according to former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in 2016, we need to overturn Citizens United because that would essentially promote fairness. Now, in the eyes of populists and progressives alike, the Citizens United decision allows for rich individuals in the form of corporations to pool together large sums of money to promote political ideas and support politicians. But, of course, that assertion begs the following questions. First, is the ruling in Citizens United fair? And second, did the ruling truly turn corporations into people? Now, in Citizens United, the court held that the First Amendment extends protections to associations of individuals and not just individual speakers. Additionally, the First Amendment disallows prohibitions of speech based on the identity of the speaker. Therefore, corporations as associations of individuals have freedom of speech rights. Now, in an earlier case, Buckley v. Vallejo, the court held that spending money is necessary to disseminate speech. And thus, limiting the spending is unconstitutional. Consequently, 
the Citizens United ruling reaffirms the court's decision in Buckley. Furthermore, an alleged government interest in leveling the playing field, or I guess you could also call it equalizing speech, between different speakers would be an inherent violation of the U.S. Constitution and would be entirely indefensible, no matter what a politician might shout or tweet. Now, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, which is also uh, alter alternately known as BICRA or as McCain-Feingold, named after its two sponsors, limits corporations from making direct contributions. And that is to say funding coordinated with a candidate. Now in Citizens United and earlier cases, the court did uphold regulations of direct contributions to candidates and recognized a governmental interest in preventing quid pro quo corruption and the appearance of such corruption. Nevertheless, the court refrained from extending this government interest to independent expenditures. Now, from a different definitional perspective, independent expenditures are funds used to promote a political idea or platform without the consent or coordination of a political candidate. And so, in light of this, because independent expenditures are uncoordinated with political candidates, the court conversely held that government had no compelling interest in regulating such uncoordinated spending. So really, in sum, Citizens United is fair in the greatest sense of the word. It protects against speech discrimination based on the identity of the speaker. And while the media or politicians may cry that the Citizens United decision does the opposite, Think of the doomsday consequences if the government were allowed to prohibit political speech based on the identity of the speaker. Now that, to me, seems like a true threat to what people commonly call democracy. Now after reading the opinion in Citizens United, it logically follows that corporations are not people. And, more importantly, the United States Supreme Court did not birth the notion that corporations are people. You have to get beneath the fear-mongering headlines and distracting rhetoric of classism to realize that a corporation is nothing more than a mere collection or association of people. That's it. So, while the truth is, corporations are not people, it is true that people are corporations. And it is for that reason that restricting the speech of corporations is a fundamental violation of not one, but two separate First Amendment protected rights, freedom of speech and freedom of association. So let's quickly recap the basic facts of Citizens United. What was the case all about? Well, the organization Citizens United challenged a federal election commission violation they were hit with. You may be asking what FEC regulation did they violate? Did they, I don't know, bribe a politician? Did they give donations without disclosing them? Were they spending money that originally came from foreign governments? No. Citizens United got in trouble for showing a movie. Now, remember when I said it was going to get deliciously ironic? This is where it gets deliciously ironic. They got in trouble for airing a movie called Hillary the Movie. It was a 2008 political documentary produced by the nonprofit organization Citizens United. It was a film that was simply critical of Hillary Clinton. Now, the movie was offered as an on-demand video on cable before the 2008 Democratic primaries. 
and therefore it fell under uh, what is considered to be electioneering. And the money that was spent on the film then qualified as an independent expenditure according to the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, that's the Bikra or McCain-Feingold. Now, a corporation, including a nonprofit corporation, cannot advocate for or against a candidate running for office for 30 days prior to a primary election or 60 days prior to a general election. So, under this law, a group of people needed the government's permission regarding whether or not they could show a film critical of Hillary Clinton. Now, that's the law that Citizens United nullified. The case that seemingly everyone on the left seeks to overturn. From the establishment candidates such as Hillary Clinton, to your moderate Democrats like Amy Klobuchar, to the left of the party like a Bernie Sanders or an AOC. Now, I'm willing to guess most of you probably didn't know those details. It's only because most people don't. This is really one of the most misunderstood topics in all of American politics. Now, most people think that this court decision established money is speech and corporations are people. Interestingly, those two specific phrases that everyone associates with the case never actually appear anywhere in either the decision or the dissent. And second of all, neither the concept of corporate personhood nor the connection between money and speech were ever disputed by either party to the case. Now, most commentators thought, though not all, that their opposition should be grounded to the Supreme Court's ruling through two, one of two rather absolute principles. One, that corporations are not living persons and therefore they have no First Amendment free speech rights. Or, two, money is not speech and therefore restrictions on how money is spent cannot violate the First Amendment free speech clause. And what makes these arguments so bizarre is that none of the nine justices, including the four dissenting justices, ever argue either of those propositions, nor do they even believe them. To the contrary, all nine Justices, including the foreign dissent, agree corporations have First Amendment rights and restrictions on how money can be spent in pursuit of political advocacy does trigger First Amendment protections. Now, Justice Stevens wrote in the primary dissent for the case, quote, Of course, speech does not fall entirely outside the protection of the First Amendment merely become, because it comes from a corporation and no one suggests the contrary." End quote. Justice Stevens also wrote that even though the expenditures at issue were subject to First Amendment scrutiny, these restrictions on these expenditures were justified by compelling state interests. In other words, Stevens believes that spending money on speech is covered under the First Amendment. Congress just has an interest in regulating it in some situations. So, you see, the legal concept of corporate personhood, as I've mentioned already, goes back hundreds of years. And it's important to keep in mind a corporation legally speaking, is just a group of people. Yes, it includes large multinational for-profit corporations like Walmart, ExxonMobil, but it also includes labor unions, nonprofit corporations, uh, such as, for example, the ACLU, which probably has something to do with the fact that the ACLU actually endorsed the decision in Citizens United and wrote a great amicus brief uh, in support of the case. 
and it applies to small, uh, often usually local, uh, cell phone limited liability corporations. Granting these entities constitutional rights is simply predicated on the idea that individuals don't sacrifice any of their civil liberties when they form into groups. So I want to pose a simple question to anyone out there who is against Citizens United, who wishes to see it overturned, and anyone who claims that since corporations are not persons, they have no rights under the Constitution. And, and I, I'm genuinely posing this question, and if this is a position that you take, uh, leave me uh, a comment down below and let me know what your answer to this is, because I would genuinely be interested to hear this. Do you believe the FBI has the right to enter and search the offices of the ACLU without probable cause or a warrant and seize whatever they want from them? Do they have the right to do that in an office of a labor union? How about a local business on the corner in your town which just happened to be incorporated? The only thing stopping them from doing that is the Fourth Amendment. If you believe that corporations have no constitutional rights because they are not human beings, what possible objections could you voice to Congress empowering the FBI to do all of those things? Can the FBI simply seize these people's property, their buildings, their cars, their bank accounts of all of these entities without due process or just compensation? If you believe that corporations have no constitutional rights, what possible constitutional objection could you have to such laws? And now let's move to the point of money and speech. This is just the idea that engaging in speech in any meaningful way that is more sophisticated than standing on a street corner yelling costs money. Therefore, regulations on the money someone can spend on speaking is regulating speech by proxy. If you think about it, printing a newspaper costs money. Hosting an online news show costs money. Placing a television ad costs money. Running this YouTube channel you're watching this video on costs money. And so on and so forth. Now, regulating the amount of money that someone can spend, where they can spend that money, where they can get it, uh, how they can spend it, etc., all undoubtedly can jeopardize the speech itself. And this is why all nine justices on the court at the time agreed. And in fact, this goes back to 1976 and the Supreme Court case of Buckley v. Vallejo, which we also covered last time. Here, the majority ruled that limitations on expenditures are necessarily at odds with the First Amendment because restrictions on spending for political communication necessarily reduces the quantity of that expression. Now, the funny thing is, occasionally Citizens United critics will even acknowledge this. So, so for example, uh, Bernie Sanders on his a presidential website during his 2020 run had the following statement. Quote, And when money is speech, that means that the more money you have, the more speech you have. And if corporations are people, people who have a lot more money than you and I, and that means corporations have a lot more speech than the rest of us. End quote. I apologize for that awful Bernie Sanders impression. I didn't mean to do that. It just came out. It was awful. I'm not going to cut it. I'm not going to re-record it. Just live with it. So, they think it's unfair that some candidates can purchase more advertisements and others, and that this somehow needs to be corrected by overturning Citizens United. Now, again, the dissenting justices never said money isn't speech. What they did argue is that Congress has a compelling state interest in regulating it 
on the grounds of preventing corruption. So, does this money in the system cause corruption? Now, you may not like this answer, but to be perfectly honest, that's not relevant to the question at hand. Now, critics emphasize the court's ruling will produce a very bad outcome, uh, primarily that it will exacerbate the problem of corporate influence on our republic. Even if that's true, it's not really relevant. Either the First Amendment allows speech restrictions or it doesn't. In general, a law that violates the Constitution cannot be upheld because it produces good outcomes or because its invalidation would produce bad outcomes. Now, many think that America is too far gone in terms of uh, corporate control of politics. Now, personally, I think that money in politics is an overrated problem, but I will admit it is a problem. It certainly is. But that's not really relevant to the speech question. Now, it's also fair to say that we have racism in this country. And that's a problem, too. And allowing the KKK to hold one of their stupid fucking rallies will no doubt contribute to that problem. That doesn't mean they don't have the right to hold it, and evoking a state interest really isn't persuasive either. Because from that point, virtually anything can be justified by that rationale. And that argument has been used, uh, including in this country many times, to curtail civil liberties in other contexts. So when you talk about limiting independent expenditures, you're actually talking about limiting your ability to engage in political advocacy. Now, Citizens United simply doesn't stand for what most people will say that it does. Now, their erroneous lamentations are well characterized, I believe, by the uh, fairly infamous statement that President Obama made during his 2010 State of the Union address. With all due deference to separation of powers, Last week, the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations, to spend without limit in our elections. I don't think American elections should be bankrolled by America's most powerful interests, or worse, by foreign entities. They should be decided by the American people. And I'd urge Democrats and Republicans to pass a bill that helps correct it. Now, in that one sentence, the former law professor made four errors that are all too common from Citizens United critics. It seems that even after 12 years, critics of the Supreme Court just cannot get things right. Now, what mistakes did he make? First of all, Citizens United did not reverse a century of law. What President Obama was referring to there was the Tillman Act of 1907, which banned corporate donations to campaigns. Such donations are still banned. Instead, the decision overturned a 1990 precedent that upheld a ban on independent spending by corporations. This 1990 ruling, uh, ruling was the only time that the court allowed a restriction on political speech for a reason other than the need to prevent corruption. Second, his talk about floodgates really depends on how you define the term. Now, in modern times, nearly every election cycle has seen an increase in political spending. However, there is no indication that there is a significant change in corporate spending, and the rules affecting independent spending by wealthy individuals who are spending more have not changed at 
all. Indeed, much of the corporate influence peddling in Washington that has reformers concerned has nothing to do with campaign spending. Most corporations spend far, far more money lobbying lawmakers already in Washington than they do in political spending to try and help choose which politicians will be going to Washington. And this is the problem that Citizens United detractors don't argue the case on the merits as much as they use it as a focal point for their personal hatred of corporations. Now, I have no problem with people hating corporations. What I do have a problem with is people who believe that their hatred justifies either willful ignorance of the law or intentional misrepresentation of the law in the name of fighting a personal crusade. People who see their cause as so righteous and just that our constitutionally protected individual liberties and even truth itself are seen as expendable casualties in their anti-corporate crusade. Because Citizens United is not just about restricting all the big multinational corporations that everyone loves to hate. And fourth, while independent spending on elections now has few limits, candidates and parties aren't so lucky, and even in as recently as 2014 in the decision of McCrutchen v. FEC, it struck down aggregate, not per candidate, contribution limits. Now, this only affected about 600 donors during that election cycle. The amount an individual can give to a single campaign remains untouched. And so if you're concerned about the money spent on the problem, it isn't with big corporate players. It isn't really Exxon, Halliburton, and all of these evil companies that are suddenly dominating the conversation through electioneering expenditures. Why? They spend little on political ads because they don't want to alienate half of their customer base. Now, on the other hand, smaller players now have the ability to speak freely. Citizens United allows groups such as the National Federation of Independent Businesses, the Sierra Club, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the National Rifle Association to speak freely. And so, even if we accept their leveling the playing field as a proper basis for regulation, the freeing of associated speech already achieves that goal. As I've already said before, uh, to wrap up here, people don't lose their rights when they get together, be it in a union, an advocacy group, a private club, or even a for-profit enterprise, or any other way. By removing limits on independent political speech, spending by people unconnected to candidates and parties, Citizens United has weakened the government's control of who can speak, how much, and on what subject. And that is a good thing. All right, well, that is going to do it for me here today. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to Categorical Imperatives. Uh, now, don't forget, you can, uh, if you like the video, go ahead and hit that little thumbs up button on the bottom of the video. Uh, if you disliked it, hit that little thumbs up downy button down there if you're not subscribed to the channel maybe considering taking a second and doing that so you always know when my newest and latest stuff comes out and of course if you would like to leave me a comment i either answering any of the open questions i pose during this video which i really would genuinely love to hear people's responses to or just any other comments you have about uh this video about the topic about anything please let me know down in the description and then, uh, of course, if you uh, are able to help support the show, such as by becoming a supporter, a patron over on Patreon, or something along those lines, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. 
Uh, and if you can't, that's all right. I understand. I still appreciate you coming by and spending some of your time here with me today all the same. And that goes for whether you're a first-time a first viewer or a long-time subscriber. So, I will be back soon. I guess all that's left to do is to sign out. Uh, this has been Locking Liberal for Categorical Imperatives, talking about Citizens United. And of course, as always, Daylenda, that's Carthago.